Continuing with this next chapter, let's now look at the geography of the story. We were, at the time we received those uh, visas through the generosity of my uncle in Harbin, Uncle Lyova, we were living in Kiev. And we started out from Kiev to Moscow in order to connect with the Trans-Siberian Railway. No sooner did we arrive in Moscow as uh, one of our big suitcases was stolen at the station, <laughs> just to make our travel a little more exciting. There were, of course, four of us, three adults, my mother, my father, and Polya, and uh, one non-adult, myself, age all of one. And I think we stayed in Moscow for a while with some problem with tickets and, and so on and so forth. And then finally we started out. Now this is, you cannot probably see there the thin thread on the map, but this is the Trans-Siberian Railroad, Moscow, Moscow like this. then down to the southern tip of Lake Baikal by Irkutsk and then further on to um, the border of Manchuria here. There we crossed the border into what was nominally China and I stress nominally but actually the power of the Chinese government at that time did not reach into Manchuria as it did not reach to many other places in China and China was under control of various warlords. But within China there was however an island of stability and that was the Russian round railway that the Russians had built at the end of the 19th century and of which Harbin was the hub. So we went on to Harbin and uh, here is her bed. That's where Uncle Ulova was living with his Russian wife. And he was in the business of importing sugar. That was long before he became a manufacturer of sugar. And he, where did he import from? He, he imported it from a place that's not far from your place in the world, namely from Java. And he also imported from India what was known as gunny bags. You know that expression? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jute bags. Mm -hmm. uh, both for packing sugar but also for packing soybeans that were the big export from Manchuria at that time. At that time the only soybeans entering world trade were those grown in Manchuria. Later on we would occasionally go down here to Dairan and I went to high school here in uh, yeah. Tianjin mm -hmm. and we also took trips to Japan. But that is a later chapter in this whole story. Well, that trip uh, on the Trans-Siberian and then on the Chinese Eastern Railway to Harbin took something like a month. And I've certainly heard a great deal about it from my parents for many, many years because that was one of the most miserable months they ever had. Not only because of the state of the railroad and the complete lack of services and the problem of getting food and so on and so on and so forth, but to a large extent also because of me, one-year-old kid who was giving them just an awful time and for a whole month. Fortunately, Polya was with us and she helped as best she could, but it was hell. One of the things that, of course, was a problem is uh, not only changing the kids, but also getting some clothes for the kid. And under the circumstances, one had to be inventive, and my mother was. On one occasion, sewing a pair of shorts for me from uh, somebody's, I'm not sure whose, men's trousers pockets. Here they are. As you can see, the, the, the good, strong material of uh, men's trousers might even have been from a military uniform, for all I know. A kind of set of suspenders going over my shoulder and to the other side. Somewhere she even found a button. Uh, my legs came out here, and everything else came out here. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it really 
any wonder that my, my mother never threw these pants away, but kept them all her life as one of her treasures. And then after she passed away, we took over as keepers of the famous trousers. <laughs> now, I presume that the little boy who wore that garment we just saw sometimes wore something over it, and I think this sort of hospital gown type of, of thing must have been what boys, little boys were wearing on the Trans-Siberian. Then, of course, when he got to Harbin, why his wardrobe increased. Here's a little coat. Uh, oh, see? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this one has a, a cap that goes with it because after all, oh, the ray cap. so mm -hmm. this is probably your second birthday outfit. Yeah. Um, I don't know, you know, uh, I imagine that uh, Greg didn't put up very long with wearing dress style things or maybe this is something that he brought home from kindergarten as a trophy, I don't know. <laughs> and then finally, <laughs> finally this was a little uh, all season coat, I believe. Oh uh, yes. You know, see, it's padded and so on. Now, look at the strap here. Yeah, yeah this for hanging. So right. my father didn't even know we had these, but you have been keeping them. Well, you see, sure. yes, when we cleared things out of Greg's mother's house in San Francisco, Amy and I did quite a bit of excavating in a trunk, and I don't remember whether these particular things were things that she and I turned out, but somehow uh, these all came from San Francisco, and so I've been harboring them all these years oh, for this great. moment to display them. That's great. There was a shortage of blue in those days. You want to try it on for the camera? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so we arrived in Harbin in uh, early March or possibly even late February 1923. A bustling town, no longer really having the appearance of a frontier town, but in many respects of uh, a well-established town with culture and educational institutions and newspapers and so on and so forth, inhabited by something over a hundred thousand people originally from Russia, and in their ethnic, national and other composition pretty much of a representative sample of the population of the old Russian Empire. Of course the majority were Russians by nationality, the common language was Russian, but uh, there were also uh, lots of uh, Armenians, Georgians, Balts, Finns, uh, Ukrainians, of course, and Jews. Uh, now, the history of Harbin was uh, established, indeed, it was built from nothing after the Russians signed the treaty with the Chinese to build the Chinese Eastern Railway through Manchuria. Construction of Harbin began very, very soon thereafter, and by 1898, that is two years after the treaty was signed, quite a few buildings for the staff of the railroad and others were already in place, and particularly the large Russian cathedral was consecrated as early as 1898. It was a very beautiful cathedral, built of wood in the style of northern Russian cathedrals, and reputedly without the use of a single screw or nail, just wood mortise fitted together, which is of course the way northern Russian churches are built, perhaps in addition to the rather elaborate Art Nouveau style railway station, the structure in Herbin. It stood on a little hill uh, visible from afar. It stood for some 60 plus years when during the Chinese Cultural Revolution it was dismantled by the Red Guards piece by piece. They didn't even have to pull any nails or unscrew any screws. And they piled all the beams and uh, trunks and logs and boards onto one big pile and had a hell of a lot big bonfire in the middle of that square. So that was her bin. It has also a bit, had also a busy, bustling uh, business street, which we called Kitaiske, meaning Chinese street, although it was in the Russian part of town. And this first picture is part of that main shopping street. The tall building uh, with a cupola was a Japanese department store, Matsura, 
And this side of it, uh, where all kinds of others, we can see the sign that reads Wagon Lee Cook. That was obviously a travel agency. And uh, either to the right of it or to the left of it, off the edge of the picture, was a very famous cafe called Mars, which uh, was sort of uh, the place where the elite used to meet to eat, to use the old American expression. Across the street was another well-known building, a, by that time, very modern hotel, and it was a large and well-constructed, well-appointed, in some respects also Art Nouveau style, but also Beaux-Arts style, which was appropriately named Modern, Hotel Modern. This is uh, one corner of the building that occupied the length of a whole block. This was the hotel? Hotel Modern here. Mm -hmm. At this same spot, that is on this same corner, stood a very fine jewelry store owned by the same person who owned the Hotel Modern, a certain gentleman by the name of Casper. Also in the same building was a big ballroom, and later on a movie. It was real class. And the rooms were very good indeed. And it was in this hotel that um, Uncle Leova plunked us down when we first arrived. We lived there for a number of months until we found a suitable apartment. Now, this street, the ch so-called Chinese street, was the main street of a section of town, of the city of Harbin, called Priestin. Priestin, roughly translated, from the Russian means the port area, or the port itself, or the dock itself. It was the commercial and to some extent industrial place. It was largely inhabited by people from Russia, but it also tended to contain the primary concentration of the Jewish population in Harbin. There were other parts. Harbin was a well-planned city and uh, rather handsome. And you have to remember that at that time it was at most only 25 years old, before then there was nothing there at all. There was also a Chinese city, a kind of uh, twin city arrangement, which was a typical Chinese city with narrow streets and uh, bazaar-like streets and so on, much more densely settled than the Russian part, with which actually the Russian population had only limited contact. The Chinese population may have had more of a contact because many of the Chinese worked for Russian employers or for Russian households as cooks and so on, and many also worked on the railroad run by Chinese. Technically, the railroad was half Chinese, half Russian-owned, but of course, given the lack of expertise by the Chinese, lack of uh, trained people and so on, it was primarily run by the Russians, and indeed the Russians intended it to be such from the very beginning. So, uh, after that, we moved to another street, still in the same part of town, to an apartment, and lived there for um, probably about eight years. Moved several times uh, in the span of maybe two, three years. But finally, we settled down elsewhere, and then I hope to show a picture of that later on. Let me, however, show now some pictures of people of that period. I'm not sure how old I was there, but probably about between two and three, something like that. Uh, this was <laughs> taken in a resort place, some hours ride by train from Harbin, and uh, my parents were properly dressed for the resort, my m mother in a white dress, and there I was, I'm not sure entirely happy. <laughs> And my father's Panama hat can be seen at the end of the bench. The, this was a fashion? Yeah, in those days it was a very much American fashion. Yeah. All right, now I don't know uh, whether this picture I'm putting down now was taken at about the same time, but of course my mother's dress suggests that. And, um, and, the, and your father's haircut. Suggested. And my father's haircut, and also my face suggests that. <laughs> but here, in addition to the nuclear family of three, we have, of course, Paulie sitting next to me and my father, and behind Uncle Lova and his wife, his Russian wife, known as Varvara, or in English, Barbara. Mm -hmm. 
but they didn't remain married very much longer. They divorced probably a few years after that because by 1927, Ankolova married Polya. Polya had been briefly married in Harbin before that. It was a very unhappy marriage. Very unhappy.